Welcome to Ninja the Cat stage and the first day of HipCon. I hope you enjoyed the, the talk that Dave just gave in the, to the H, part, H Prime stage. And now we will continue here. I'll be a host today. My name is Ivana. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Now, as I'm sure there are a lot of Java developers in the audience today, this will be a real treat for them. Um, this year, the Java Community Process Program celebrates 20 years of Java standards development. We'll hear some first-hand insights, as well as how and why to participate in the evolution of the Java platform. Our first presenter has been leading the Java Community Standardization efforts at Oracle and the Global Community Driven Adoption User Programs. She has also been pushing for broadening participation and diversity in the community. She is passionate about Java, women in technology, and developer communities has been, and has been contributing in all of these areas for more than two decades. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Heather Vancura. All right. Heather, welcome to HIPCON. The stage is yours. Thank you. Great to be here. First time in Serbia. The Future of Java and You is the title of this session. I also sometimes call it How to Navigate the Java Ecosystem because there have been a lot of changes introduced into the ecosystem over the last couple of years and often developers come to me for a little bit of guidance. So um, as was, I was introduced, I'm the chairperson and director of the Java community process and that means that Oracle employs me, so I will be saying many uh, forward-looking statements about the future of Java, so that's the legal coverage. Uh, I have been involved with the Java community since 2000. I joined Sun Microsystems um, at that time working with the Java developer community. So I have a unique perspective in terms of how Java has evolved uh, since the very early days through the transition of open source and continuing to embrace the community and Java developer feedback. And often people will ask me why I've been involved with one particular role for so long, and it really is because of you, the Java developer community. It's always encouraging to hear your feedback and answer your questions and be able to evolve and adapt Java to suit your needs because that really is what has made Java so successful is the way that we are able to incorporate feedback from the developer community. I do live in California, the San Francisco Bay Area, but one of my passions is traveling, so it's really cool that I had an opportunity to visit a new country to come speak to you at HeapConf. If I don't answer your questions in this talk, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at HeatherVC, and I'm happy to answer any questions as well as hang around a little bit after my talk if you want to hear more from me. So how many of you are Java developers in the audience? That's good, you're in the right place. So I have good news for you as well. Java continues to be the number one programming language 20 years after it was introduced. And we've grown to have over 12 million Java developers. The focus for the Java platform, which is specifically what I'm gonna be talking about today, the Java SE platform, is focused on the cloud and connecting devices to the cloud and making Java the preferred platform and language in a cloud environment. And I believe we are poised to do that. And that is because we have remained true to the philosophies that I've seen consistent over time. And that is how Java will continue to be the number one platform moving into the future in terms of the things that we typically look at and when we make and introduce changes to the platform is ensuring its completeness, but also the quality and security of the platform. And security does remain our number one priority as we modernize and take in new innovations and we We've changed things in the last couple of years in terms of the way we're going to do that, which I'll go into later. But I think what is truly unique about Java and which does um, propel it to continue to be the number one programming language is the way that we evolve Java. And it is truly unique in the way we do that and bringing in um, developer feedback as well as at the same time balancing it with continued compatibility, backwards portability and compatibility and bringing in an ecosystem that's not about any one company. So it's really about enabling an entire ecosystem of businesses that build their uh, futures on Java, as well as you as developers that continue to enhance your skills using Java technology. 
And as was mentioned, we're celebrating 20 years of the JCP program. Java has changed a lot in that time, and we have adapted in order to address those things. Um, but one of the great, one of the unique things about Java is that all of the compatibility and community participation that is fostered in the ecosystem is enabled by the Java community process program. And what I found in a lot of my travels and talks with developers is most people don't even know what the JCP program is. I'll just take another quick show of hands. Who knows what the JCP is? Most of you don't. And I'm here to share with you, before I get into the changes of the Java platform, a 10-minute overview on what is the JCP. So the Java community process uh, acts as the uh, overseen of the standardization of the Java efforts. So everything in the Java X namespace is overseen by the Java community process. That means that everything going into Java SE and um, the platform itself, Java SE and the JDK, is overseen by an organization uh, that has an executive committee and a program office. I act as the chair of the organization. That's my role. I oversee the executive committee and a small staff to um, do the overall governance of the organization. But the main work of the organization, the JCP, is done by members of the Java developer community. Then we organize ourselves uh, with specification leads. So those are the leaders of the projects leading in open source projects, because Java is open source now, um, with members of the JCP acting as uh, expert group members, as well as um, contributors participating in the evolution of the projects. And it's all open to you as Java developers to also get involved in the process. And later in my talk, I'm going to share with you some tips on how you could do that. So every project is organized as a JSR. Most developers have actually heard of that term, a Java specification request, or JSR. So that's a single version of a Java specification. And the JCP is unique in the way it oversees Java and how it develops and evolves the language in that it's about more than just the code, and it's also more than just the spec. So it's three deliverables working together. Everything that goes into Java before it can be used in any code in production must deliver three things, the specification, the reference implementation, and a test suite. So those three things work together to enable an ecosystem of choice in implementations. That's also one of the reasons why Java is so well and thoroughly documented, is because documentation is not an afterthought like it is in so many open source projects these days. It's a requirement of the JCP. So before anything can be finalized and um, put out in a Java uh, release, it has to have a full, complete specification, as well as the reference implementation, and a test suite to enable other community members to be able to build their own compatible implementations and be able to call it Java once it passes the TCK. So that's what enables so many different companies to build their businesses on Java and offers you, as developers, choices, as well as being able to transfer your skills in between implementations. So the three things works together. Um, requires strong compatibility, um, and the TCK allows us to have choice and also maintain that compatibility, provided that the implementation that you choose is passing the TCK. So that's the test suite. So that provides assurances around the business needs of Java, so ensuring that we continue to have that compatibility. And this is nothing new, but really just kind of reinforcing how the ecosystem works and some of the things that you may not realize about the technology that you use every day and the assurances that it provides in terms of safety and intellectual property as well as choice in between the implementations. So many companies participate in the JCP, but we also have individuals who want to participate in the JCP. And that really boils down to three reasons why people want to get involved in this effort. First of all, if you're a company, you want to ensure that you're going to be able to implement your products using the latest version of Java. But if you're an individual like a couple of these folks that I asked, uh, why are they participating in this effort? Why are they taking the time apart from their employment and their day-to-day -day jobs uh, to put 
put forth time, energy, and resources into participating in the future of Java. And really, it boils down to at career advancement, as well as it's like being a citizen of the Java community. That's one of my favorite quotes. Joining the JCP is like being a Java citizen. So again, it works through Java specification requests. Since the JCP started, we have over 400 Java specification requests. And as I said, each JSR is really three things, a spec, the RI, and the TCK. And all of that work, as it's developed, is done by members of the JCP. But you don't have to be a member of the JCP to participate in that life cycle. And again, the checks and balances, really the main role of the executive committee is to approve everything in a JSR before it can be finalized. So that's the executive committee and the work that they do. And we do this in an international effort. So one of the things that was talked about in the introduction was diversity. So that's diversity beyond men and women, but diversity of thought and opinions, as well as geography and where developers are paced. And we do have developers working in this effort all around the world, um, six continents at least. I haven't visited developers yet in Antarctica, but um, if you know of anyone, let me know. And the uh, same thing in the membership. We have corporations participating, nonprofit groups, Java user groups, um, as well as individual Java developers of the JCP. And our executive committee also has that balance. Here's a picture here from our last executive committee meeting at Twitter headquarters in San Francisco. We meet on a bi-monthly basis and review issues in the Java community, as well as um, talk about the work of the JSRs being developed that are targeted to be part of the Java platform. So right now, we're at 23 members. Uh, I'm the chairperson. And then we have people who are representing corporations, as well as open source groups uh, like the Eclipse Foundation, Java user groups, and individual Java developers. And as I mentioned earlier, Java is developed as open source projects with the community and by the community. But we continue to, make, to maintain with Java. And what is unique about it is that it's not, open source is not enough. Uh, we need the software to be developed as open source. That's kind of a standard requirement of how software is developed today. But we maintain we also need it to be a standard. And we continue to assure that through development in the JCP. In the JCP, we cooperate together on the standard. And then we compete on the implementations. And that results in greater adoption of the standard, as well as more choices for you as developers. So hopefully now you can understand a little bit about what the JCP is. Uh, for the remainder of my talk, I focused three things. Uh, new, new revisions to the platform, what's coming next in the Java standard platform, how we're evolving the program, and how you can participate in the effort. So as I mentioned, uh, Java SE is organized is by JSRs. But the work of the reference implementation and the code is developed in open source. And that project where the code for Java SE is developed is in the Open JDK project. Uh, that's the place uh, where community members work together on the reference implementation. So OpenJDK is the reference implementation for the Java SE platform. And it feeds up into a JSR. But the work of OpenJDK is organized into JEPs, or Java Enhancement Proposals. So that's how those two things work together. Probably the top question I get from developers is, what's the difference between the JSRs and the JEPs? So how it works is there's many JEPs, Java Enhancement Proposals, developed within OpenJDK. And those then feed up into a platform JSR. And that JSR must then be approved by the executive committee before it can be finalized. So right now, in terms of versions of the Java platform, the last major release is Java 13. That was released last week. Um, starting in 2017 with Java 9, so we moved from Java 9 to Java 13 in just a couple of years, we introduced the concept of modularity. And what that really enabled us to do is move to a faster release cadence. So that means now um, Java platform versions are coming out every six months versus every three to four years, which if you've been developing in Java for a, a while, you've gotten accustomed to that longer release cycle. So that's one of the changes that I I talked about in the beginning is that changes in the community. So that's 
one of the biggest changes in the Java developer community that's been introduced is that idea of a faster release cadence. And I talked about also maintaining Java as the number one programming language. And we believe this is one of the ways that we can do that by keeping pace um, with the uh, speed of innovation that many other technologies are moving at today, which is a faster cadence, a faster pace, introducing new innovations into the platform and in the into the technology. And that will continue to help us attract younger developers who may see Java as an older programming language, as well as enable us to move more incrementally and gradually and changes to the platform and focus on smaller improvements over time rather than getting lost with one major feature and having it take several years. Secondly, in terms of changes, new to the Java ecosystem is the concept of long-term support releases. So that's not new in the technology landscape, but it's new to the Java developer community. So what that means is that every three years, there will be a long-term support release of Java. So we'll have releases coming out still every six months, but every three years, one release will be designated as a long-term support release. And so that means that um, the release that came out uh, last year, Java 11, is the first long-term support release. Uh, so that means every six months, there'll be releases. They'll have a, a couple of updates within the six-month period. But then every three years, you can get uh, support for that long-term support release. And that will be offered by Oracle, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, other community members. So that means choices in terms of your binary distributions of Java. And while there have always been choices. This has kind of introduced a little bit of inquiries from developers in terms of how do I choose. And again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, as long as you're choosing an implementation that is passing the TCK, we continue to ensure that compatibility that we've come to rely on in Java technology. Thirdly, um, around the same time of 2017, we introduced some new ability to have new features coming into Java. So Oracle decided to open source many of their commercial features that previously had only been part of the Oracle JDK into OpenJDK. So that created also a richer pipeline of new features coming into the platform following Java 9. And that was done using the same process that I described earlier of developing the JEPs within OpenJDK and feeding those JEPs up into a platform JSR. So that was done gradually over time but as of Java 11, uh, OpenJDK 11 now includes many features that were previously only available to Oracle customers now in the open source OpenJDK version. So some cool features like Flight Recorder and Mission Control um, that offer new features and functionality to the entire developer ecosystem. So um, lots of changes, as I mentioned, and uh, this does create a little bit of uncertainty for folks. So I walked through, starting with Java 9, the different releases and how it works. So with Java 9, many people uh, uh, acquaint that with modularity or Project Jigsaw, which was the case uh, in the history of Java. You would pick one major feature, and you would work on that major feature or project until that major feature or project was done. And then in your mind, you would think of that release as only about that project. But in reality, if you think about all the work that was done over the four years between Java 8 and Java 9, it actually encompassed over 100 new features. So moving in between platform releases at that time with the major release cycle was obviously a really big software development project. It was disruptive to people's teams um, and often you know, it was something that was planned for months in advance and took months to a year to complete. And what we found was that moving to a faster six-month release cadence, or we, as we call it, a feature release cadence, you're introducing more gradual changes and also being less disruptive to internal development teams as you decide to migrate in between versions. So we're moving to a method that really is more in, in keeping with the way software is developed now, more of an agile continuous delivery method. But obviously, it's a different way of thinking about moving in between releases. So what that means is every six months, whatever JEPs are ready and uh, ready to be released and fed up into a platform release, that's done so. So that means that whatever's ready within six months is going to be shipping in the next version of Java, and that's a feature release. And it may have 
one JEP in it, and it may have up to, I think, 12 JEPs is the maximum. So JDK 10 was released in March 2018. It was the first feature release, had 12 new features in it, as compared to, like I showed you with Java 9, over 100 new features, which would, used to be typical of a Java platform release. So what this enables is you to have new access to these new um, developments in Java. For example, one of the most popular ones for Java 10 is the introduction of the var keyword. So that's something that typically um, developers would have had to wait three to four years for that to be available to use, even though it was already ready. Um, so again, introducing new um, innovations into the platform on a more incremental and gradual basis. So Java 11 was released a year ago in September 2018. That was the first long-term support release. But one interesting thing to note and important to keep in mind is that technically there's nothing different about those releases. Um, the team with working within OpenJDK isn't saving features to be part of long-term support releases. Again, whatever's ready to be shipped into that platform release will be put into it. And then the su long-term support is really more about how you're going to support um, whatever you're using in production after the fact. So one of the interesting things to note is that with Java 11, we also introduced a new concept, which is preview features. So we introduced the idea of preview features, which are fully um, implemented and specified within the version of the platform, but they aren't turned on automatically. You have to um, go in and turn those features on. And the idea with those is that they may, they may be removed later. Um, they will be enhanced, but we're looking for more feedback before we put them as part of a, a regular feature in the platform. One of the interesting things to note is I have the hashtag that we worked on on that um, platform release, works like heaven on JDK 11. So around that time, a lot of people were wondering, are the IDEs and the tools community going to be able to keep up with this faster release cadence and be ready for Java 10, 11, 12, 13, 14? And what we found is that the majority of the community is able to keep up with this, that faster release cadence because of the fact that we're putting out early access release builds every couple of weeks. So again, working more on that um, continuous delivery methodology of downloading the early access builds on a regular basis and evaluating what changes you would need to make in your application if you were to migrate to that version and working on it in tandem. The, all the IDEs were working within the first day on JDK 11. JDK 12 uh, came out in March uh, earlier this year, and that included eight Java enhancement proposals, or in other words, about eight new features. Um, also, the first preview fe feature, which is switch expressions, so that's available now. In addition, it had a um, garbage collector contribution from another community member, Red Hat, which is Shannon Doa, and a few other features um, that are introduced into the platform as of JDK 12. But an interesting thing to note is in addition to being more of an incremental release, we're continuing to see more participation from the community. So people like um, JetBrains and Bellsoft and Red Hat and SAP continuing to make actual um, significant contributions into the platform. So really, the evolution of the technology is not just being contributed by Oracle, but by other community members as well, which is a sign of health in the Java ecosystem. So JDK 13 was released uh, last week, September 17th. It's available now. It included five JEPs, um, including um, updates to the CDS archives and updates to the ZGC garbage collector, which is now the default garbage collector in Java, as as well as a couple of enhanced uh, preview features. So enhancements to the switch expressions, uh, which came out in the previous release, as well as a, a preview of text blocks for the Java platform. So that was approved by the executive committee last week, but work has already started on Java 14. So Java 14 will plan to be released of March next year. And new JEPs are being uh, targeted for it on an ongoing basis. So again, whatever is ready and targeted to be part of Java 14 will be included. And as I've been going through, you've seen I've had a visual. So this is a snapshot from uh, the OpenJDK website. Every platform released has a wiki page like this one. So what that means is this is where you can go and see what um, JEPs are targeted to be part of that platform release. Like, for instance, this morning it was announced that um, 
uh, no pointer exceptions um, dynamics is going to be added to Java 14. In addition to looking at the platform release page where you can also get the early access builds like I talked about earlier, downloading those on a continuous basis and running your applications against the early access build in development, not in production, so if, and evaluating as you think about migrating to the next version is a really good habit to get into. But also, you, we continue to have those named projects that we've all, all, always gotten accustomed to having, so the things like Project Jigsaw that happened in OpenJDK. Many of the projects are continuing to be developed in OpenJDK. I'm going to highlight some of the major ones um, that might be of interest to you in terms of new features and functionality that will be coming out beyond Java 14 into the future, and maybe some areas where you might want to get involved and follow along more closely. So the way this works now is that rather than picking one of these feature releases and targeting it for the next major uh, release, it's now feature releases. And what that means is as work is developed within these projects, Java enhancement proposals will be put forward from the projects and then targeted for the platform releases. So that what that means is you're not going to have to wait until Valhalla is officially fully complete, implemented, and specified to start using some of the features and functionality out of that project. As things are ready within the project, it will be put into a JEP and then targeted for a Java platform. So little incremental changes will come out of each of these projects. And in terms of looking at the, the roadmap and, and where we're going in terms of the direction for Java, security will continue to be the number one priority. Um, but some of the other things that we're looking at is improving developer productivity, increasing density, improving startup time, predictability, and simplifying serviceability and profiling. And I've mapped these projects uh, where you can see that we'll be focusing on some of these goals and time investments from the architects working at Oracle as well as from community members. So these are all projects where you could look at getting involved and following along in the discussions. So each of these projects has their own wiki pages on OpenJDK and their own discussion mailing list. Some of them even have their own project-specific early access builds. So if you're interested in getting uh, your hands on some of the code early before it's put into an early access build, you can also do that. So one of the most exciting ones that developers um, have gener generated interest in is Project Valhalla. So that's going back to increasing density and looking at object data layout, introducing value types to the Java platform. So early access builds are out for this. There aren't any JEPs targeted yet, but there is an early access build that came out in July um, that you might want to take a look at. Project Portola, as I focused, we're, as I mentioned, we're focused on Java being the ideal environment for the cloud. So, of course, Java in a world of containers is really important. And within uh, Project Portola, they're focus, focusing on the characteristics of Java and enhancing those so that we will continue to make Java the ideal uh, environment for cloud deployments. And we also have Project Panama. So pro in Project Panama, um, they're focusing on uh, the big data machine learning space. Uh, so while we have a standalone JSR being developed through the JCP, which is the Visual Recognition API, and there's actually a talk um, from the spec lead of that project um, giving a talk at this conference right after my talk at 11, Zorin. So he's talking about a standalone API for visual recognition in this space. But within the OpenJDK team, they're also looking at this space in Project Panama. So how to make Java um, the ideal choice for machine learning, big data, and AI, and looking at more Looking at more in this project um, how Java can run better in a native environment and looking at a replacement for JNI. And another project that's in uh, stages of development, not introduced any Java enhancement proposals yet, is an update to the concurrency model. So we haven't had that since Java 5. But with Project Loom, um, they're looking at some interesting approaches to uh, sp spawn millions of fibers into a single JVM instance. 
And finally, the last project I'll highlight is Project Amber. So in Project Amber, they're looking at um, language improvements, a collection of smaller language improvements. And this is where switch expressions um, is coming out of, as well as the dynamic, dynamic class file update that I talked about in Java 13. So these projects will continue on an ongoing basis. Um, one of the more exciting ones that people are looking at is also pr uh, pattern matching, which is JEP 305. So that's being organized and worked on within Project Amber, so language imp Java language improvements. Many of these projects do have early access builds, and the platform itself has early access builds. So early access builds now for Java 14 are out. They come out every two weeks. You can download those um, for your use in development and evaluate how you're going to move between the versions, as well as any changes you would need to make to your application. You can follow OpenJDK on Twitter, and you can also become a contributor to OpenJDK if you choose to. But again, as I mentioned, all of those projects have open mailing lists that don't require you to join or sign anything. It's just a matter of subscribing to the mailing list, and the downloads are always available and accessible to anyone without any um, membership needed. But if you choose to get more involved and want to become a contributor, that's also an option for you. Another common thing I get asked about with the move to this faster release cadence uh, was the certification and training. Um, right now, the, the, last, the last one that was updated was Java 8 a couple of months ago, but just uh, a couple months ago, they released the Java 11 certification and training. So that's now available, and they're offering a 25% off discount to Java user group members. And I know you have a Java user group here, so if you're interested in that, get in touch with your local Java user group. So many changes, as I talked about, the JCP evolves to adapt with these changes. And we can't just uh, randomly change how the JCP works. We have to do that with the executive committee. So that's part of my role as chairperson of the JCP, is to adapt how the rules and governance of the community work. And we've had to make three major changes to how, the, how things work as we've evolved into a faster release cadence and introduce some other changes to the community. And number one among those is transparency. So as I've been mentioning throughout my talk, this is all available and accessible to you. Um, that's required for open source development, but the rules of the JCP didn't always require that. So we've changed the rules to require everything to be open and accessible. We also used to have multiple executive committees for the platforms, but as I mentioned earlier, focus now for the JCP and the, the work that will continue to be overseen by the JCP is focused on the Java Standard Edition platform, Java SE. So we've merged into one resized executive committee. And we've also looked at ways we can continue to bring in more participation and be able to move at a faster pace. JSRs used to take multiple years to complete, and we're now completing JSRs at a six-month release cadence. So first, in terms of participation, we looked at really eliminating any barriers if you do decide you want to join the JCP. And that means no fees, um, all electronic agreements, and enabling ways for individuals who want to get involved to participate without needing to go to their employer and get a, a, a signature or their approval. So enabling a way for everyone who had a different need to be able to participate. And we did that by shifting from a one-size-fits-all membership to three different membership levels. So if you're an individual who wants to join the JCP and not participate on behalf of your employer, you can join now as an associate member. Um, and you can work on as, as a contributor on JSRs. Uh, we also wanted to enable more Java user groups to participate as partner members. So they can do that now. And then we continue to have the full members. So that's members of the JCP who want to serve uh, as a spec lead or an expert group member or on the executive committee. But we enable all different types of members to participate on the executive committee. Um, a full and a partner member be on the executive committee, but two seats to represent those associate members. And then, as I mentioned, being able to move faster. Again, the, the JSR development cycle was designed more in the days of waterfall development. So it had a lot of those artifacts of concrete milestones. So we've shifted to a more open um, development review um, rather than concrete milestones, but still ensuring we have the checks and balances of the approval by the executive committee. We do have 
a time where we allow the, um, the IP to be frozen and the executive committee to approve everything that's going into the next release of Java. So we continue to work on evolving um, the process, and we do that by using um, the process itself, and that's also done openly in, and transparently to make the JCP even more open than it was before. And leading to the last part of my talk in the last 10 minutes, um, t talking about some ways that you can participate. And what we found in studying the community and talking de to developers around the world that you can participate on your own as an individual, but it's better and more effective for you as an individual, as well as the feedback that you provide to work through uh, your Java user group or through a small group of employees at um, your company. You can help each other, teach each other, and work together. And as a result, we can achieve more. So we're working with over 80 Java user groups right now all around the world. Um, I know you do have a local user group here, but we're not engaged in this program. So that's an opportunity for maybe one of you in the audience to step up and take a leadership role in participating in some of the uh, efforts to get more involved in the effort to evolve the Java platform itself. Um, we do have jugs from all over the world in different regions. Um, I think Bulgaria is probably the closest one to you that I could potentially match you up with if you're interested in getting more engaged um, on and active in doing some hack days and keeping up um, with giving feedback. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you also can download the early access builds and give feedback to to the project leads. So as I mentioned, everything's open and transparent to you, but to really reap the benefits um, of a, a language that's going to be useful to all, we need to get more developer feedback from you. So that means if you download the early access builds and you encounter issues, uh, you find a way to feed those back into the project. And what we've done there to enable that is create within OpenJDK an adoption group. So in the adoption group, there's a mailing list called Adoption Discuss that you can join. And that's the place where you can discuss anything that you uncover as you are working wor with the platform early access builds. And there's also a quality outreach group. So this is what the early access builds page would look like. At this point now, since we just had Java 13 go final, you would go to the Java JDK 14 early access builds. There you can find um, notes, release notes, as well as some comments in terms of what's been changed in this build, what issues were, have been addressed in that build, as well as get the version um, that you want to use in your, in your um, development environment. Within the adoption group, there's also a quality outreach group. So this is a way to keep the free and open source community and tools um, that are supporting Java also to keep up with this faster release cadence. So there's over 100 projects participating in the quality outreach program. And if you are interested in participating in any open source projects, this is a great place and resource for you to go to find a project maybe that you're using or you want to start using and contact the project lead to be able to start contributing or committing to these projects. So two great examples that are participating in this project out of the 100 different projects are the Eclipse Collection project and Apache Maven. So these leaders have been able to engage with the Java developer community through this program and be able to keep up with the faster release cadence. So if you're looking for a way to differentiate yourself as a developer and want to participate in a smaller project, this is a great resource for you in OpenJDK as part of the adoption group. Again, it's called the Quality Outreach Project. And there you can find a matrix of all the projects that are available to you. Um, to help keep, ha help keep Java moving forward. So if you want to get involved in any of these things I just mentioned, I break it down into five steps for you. So the first thing is you have to pick something. So I mentioned there's standalone JSRs. Um, a great one t I can recommend is the Visual Recognition JSR. That's JSR 381, as well as the Platform JSR Java SE 14. That's JSR 389, but pick something specific that you want to do, or pick one of the projects in the quality outreach program, and find some people that together, whether it be one 
just yourself as one person or two or three to five of you that you work with or people within your local community, work on it together because what I found is together you can help and encourage each other, but pick something that you want to work on and start to research that uh, project. So every JSR developed through the JCP has a page where you can find the downloads as well as the transparency for that project. So that means, as I mentioned, public mailing list as well as a public issue tracker. Review the downloads, review the discussion, look at the issues, familiarize yourself with the project. And then secondly, communicate. So one of the biggest and most key steps in contributing to an open source project and specifically to the Java platform is really engaging and introducing yourself after you familiarize yourself with the project. What I find for most of the project leads is they really would like to receive more feedback from the community, but often they receive little to none from people who aren't actually part of their core development team or expert group. So they're looking for more feedback from you. So introduce yourself and um, give a little bit of background about who you are and what your interests are and, and what you're thinking about contributing to the project and ask for their feedback. Ask what will make an impact for them, what will be useful to them, and then decide together on what your next steps will be. And by no means is my third step um, a complete list. It, um, these are some suggestions of things that you can do um, and things that have been helpful to some of the project leads on in the Java platform. And they, they kind of run the gamut. So in the early stages, obviously, making suggestions and ideas or commenting um, on new features and functionality is good. Um, but in the later stages, taking a look at the specifications, providing comments on the Java doc in the documentation. And it can just be one section of the specification, for instance. One of the um, key benefits of Java is the completeness and thoroughness of the specifications, but we really do need more people reviewing and commenting on the specs before they become final. One of the more popular and I think probably most rewarding for developers is downloading and providing feedback on the early access builds or reference implementation before it's finalized. That can familiarize you with the new features and functionality, help you to become an expert, but also uncover maybe some issues or bugs that maybe um, others might not have found that are more familiar with the code. Uh, you can also do some more um, socializing of the technology. So give a talk at your employer, uh, uh, talking about the new feature, maybe even sharing your experience of downloading, running the early access builds. You can do that at your company. You could do that at a local meetup, whether it's your Java user group or another meetup that you attend or a conference such as this one. And sometimes even something as simple as just talking about the new features and functionality on social media, like on Twitter, Twitter, for instance, hey, did you see this new early access is build is out? Here's the link. Check it out. Or did you see that this JEP is included? So it's socializing and talking about the new features and functionality that are coming. And then really key, the next step, number four, is share any experience that you have. So what I found with some of the groups is that they will actually engage in some of these activities but not share their experience. So if they had some difficulty with their early access builds or if they uncovered an issue, they'll discuss it amongst themselves, but really making sure that you share that on the discussion list or the issue tracker. I know that OpenJDK, especially if you're working on the early access builds, you might not know where to put your feedback. But again, that's why we introduced the adoption group. So that's a great place to start. If you don't know where to go, if you're looking for something, you don't know if a new feature has been, dis been discussed in the past or you had some feedback on an early access build, the adoption group is a place where members of the community can discuss their experience and then be directed to the more appropriate and specific place to share that feedback if you're not sure where to go. And again, I think the most important step is to follow through on your actions and remember that you can have fun while you're doing this as well as look at it as a way to enhance your career and increase your skills. Um, oftentimes at conferences, this is a great thing to do is have a hack day. 
Um, what most of the groups in the Java user group adoption program have found is that incorporating some hands-on activity to do some of these things together, some of these um, ideas that I mentioned, do them together in a hack day environment. So separate from, like, instance, the conference. This is a picture from a hacker garden we had at Oracle Code 1 last year. Uh, so having that dedicated area at a conference or a separate um, meetup during for your Java user group. P basically, Java user groups typically meet once a month. They have some networking time and then a formal presentation uh, like you would have at a conference, uh, followed by maybe some snacks and a little bit more networking time at the end. And that's kind of a proven model for user groups and meetups. Um, but what groups have found is that they, if they also incorporate, in addition to those monthly meetups of presentations, have some hack day hands-on activities. And again, that's an opportunity to grow your leadership. So as a new leader coming in saying, I'd like to incorporate some hands-on activities into our meetup group as well, and, and adding that as an enhancement to bring in new members and meeting, maybe it's every week, maybe it's once a month, maybe it's every other month, we have a hands-on hack day, whether it's in the afternoon or sometimes it's a Saturday session, but that will help the user group to be able to continue and build up the leadership pipeline, as well as enhance the opportunities for working together and learning about the new technologies as they are developed. And when, as what you'll find as you start to participate in some of these activities that you're, you're growing your network and you're expanding your influence within the global Java developer community and you'll find you have connections growing way beyond just your local community. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we really do need feedback from the community. We don't get enough, even though it's enabled and allowable. Um, we don't need everyone to become a member of the JCP, but we definitely, if you are interested and you want to, you can. Everyone could join and become a member of the JCP, or at least keep up with the news and be aware of what's coming next. So if you want to do that, you can follow the JCP on Twitter at JCP underscore ORG, or my personal Twitter account is at Heather VC. Thank you for coming to my talk today. I believe I have 30 seconds for one question. And as I mentioned, I will be outside after this talk if you want to talk to me or connect with me on Twitter. So, any Thank question? you, Heather. Yeah. OK. It's amazing. Um, anybody have any questions? Over there. Back there. Yeah. Hello. OK. So we have a faster release cycle and multiple implementations. So what is being done to uh, be aware of the setup needed to run the program I'm de developing? Uh, so let me explain further. Okay. Uh, each implementation and each uh, version of Java can break the program in non-trivial ways, and I'm trying just to make the job done. What tools do I have to figure out what went wrong on the customer side when they try to run my program uh, in some other version that I developed it in? Well. I'm not sure I understand the question, but let me maybe address some of that. So moving between versions, yes, you will have to make changes to the application. What I found in talking to developers is that it is a major project to move past Java 8, but then once you get past Java 8 to the current version, so say you migrate from 8 to 11, for instance, or 8 to 13, once you get on to, to a version past 8, you would be downloading the early access builds on a a consistent basis. Maybe it's not every two weeks, but on some regular schedule, you'd be running the applications against the new version in development and then indicating what changes would need to be made to your application and making those on kind of an ongoing continuous basis in parallel um, with work that's happening in production. And then once the release is final, be able to move to that version if you choose to. But some developers aren't, aren't choosing to move every six months. Maybe they choose. What I've heard from a lot of people is they only want to move in between the long-term support releases. So that would be more 
in keeping with the type of changes you would see like in between what we used to call one version, like in, for instance, in between seven and eight or eight and nine. So if you're moving between long-term support releases, that would mean you'd move to 11 and then you would wait until the next long-term support release, which would be 17. Uh, so I think in, in, and that would be about the same amount of changes, or you have the option to take advantage of the new features and functionality on a faster release basis, which would be migrating every six months to the new version, but in, in order to do that, you would need to be taking advantage of the fact that we have those early access builds and running your application against it on an ongoing basis and noting any changes that would need to be made and making those changes. Um, on a more regular basis rather than waiting every three to four years to evaluate and make those changes to your application. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Heather, once again. All right, thank you. Thank you.